Welcome back to another episode of Sin and Tonic. We are off to Ireland, baby. Let's go. Sin and Tonic! Hi, welcome. We haven't been to Ireland for a while, so I fancied that and I thought, let's have a little look. And I cannot believe that I hadn't heard of this story before. So we're 1991 in Dublin, home to Patricia and Brian. At the time of our story, 1991, they'd been married for one year. What is a year's anniversary present? I think it's something weird and rubbish like paper. Anyway, so they've been married for one year. Everything seemed to be cushy. Patricia worked for an insurance company and she also was a bit of a fitness fanatic and she had recently undertaken a course in so she could work in a gym. What is that? To be an, a fitness instructor. That's what I mean. Oh, the words going well. What is that? I am quite tired, so bear with me. Sorry if I look like shite as well. I just couldn't be um, putting on a full face and stuff like that. We'll be on natural. I think I still have remnants of um, waterproof mascara, so that will do. So Patricia, she looks after herself. She's very into the fitness. She loves the gym. She was described as confident, clever, popular. She did well in her education, very well. She loved to run as well, and she had taken part in some half mar- half half marathons. Say that quick. So things seemed very exciting at that time for Patricia and for Brian. So newlyweds, and there was a possibility that they were going to move to LA. LA. To uh, Brian had been offered a job. I'm not sure what job, but she he was quite sporty as well. But I don't believe it was. I, I don't know actually. It could have been. It could have been anything. I don't know. So I'm not going to lie. I don't know what job anyway he was offered a job in LA and the thought process was that she could then she would go out with him obviously because they're married and then she could set up like a um in a gym set up as a fitness instructor because I guess like LA isn't that where all the beautiful people are all of the famous people so she did quite well on Friday the 30th of August 1991 Patricia and Brian they had been into the a building society had a meeting about something money obviously and they were leaving and they were in the car park and they were having just a general chit chat and they agreed that they would see each other the following day the following like Saturday evening because she was off out that Friday night with colleagues I I believe somebody was leaving they were going to go out and have a few drinks have a laugh have a little get together have a little something to eat you know all of that jazz she was going to do that Brian worked as a bouncer, so he said to her, so he that means that he would be working like in the evening times. So he said to her, look, if you're out late, don't drive home. I get the feeling that that was something that she she did. Very naughty. Even though it was 1991, it was naughty. So he said, don't drive home after a few bevies. Stay there, sleep there, but don't drive home if you have one too many. So, you know, be sensible. She agreed. She said, look, if I'm not back, I've I've stayed out. She also then planned that she was going to see her sister on the Saturday, the following day. That's why she wasn't really going to see Brian until Saturday evening, because she was going to, you know, mosey about in the morning, probably have a bit of a sore head, see her sister and then go home. However, Saturday evening came and went and Patricia did not come home. But again, so Brian is a bouncer. He had expected her to be home before he went on his shift, but she wasn't. So he just thought that she'd stayed a bit longer with her sister. He came home at six o'clock on Sunday morning after his shift. Can you? Oh, I just I'm made of different stuff to people that can do night shifts. I really am. Thank God for those people, but I'm not one of them. Anyhow, so he he rocks up home at 6 a.m. And Patricia is still not back. So now he is concerned. He rings her sister Anne at 10am on Sunday morning, but Anne hadn't seen her. She hadn't seen her at all, not even on Saturday. Patricia had not been there at all. Brian then started to ring around, you know, her colleagues, people that she worked with, her friends. And the people that she'd been out with the night on Friday night, they said that they hadn't seen her after that night. So she had left and then they never saw her again. As he is making these phone calls to try and find Patricia, he happens to catch the news. He hears that a body had been found the previous morning and there was a description of the person and also a description of that person's rings, their jewellery. And it was only when they started to describe the rings that he his ears 
pricked up. Is that the saying? Yeah. And he thought to himself, well, that sounds like Patricia's wedding ring. So he called the Gardy. That's what the police are called in Ireland. When I say it, I think it sounds like I'm saying Cardi, as in, put your Cardi on, Cardi weather. Where's your Cardi? Come on, it's chilly, put your Cardi on. But I'm saying Cardi, but in an in a Dublin accent. It sounds really nice and I can't do it. They immediately asked Brian to come to the station, where he was then interviewed for four freaking hours. During that interview, they asked him about, it will all make sense in a minute, but they asked him about Patricia's car because the day before, not at the same time as the body was discovered, but, you know, a different time, somebody had called in to say that there was an abandoned Peugeot in a certain place and it was parked in a really weird position and it looked like it had just been abandoned. When they then put the licence plate in to the system, it came back as the owner being a Patricia Mm, different surname. It wasn't Patricia O'Toole. But have I said that that was her surname? Sorry, I don't think I've just called her Patricia off the from the beginning, but it's Patricia O'Toole. So it had her maiden name. And then Brian confirmed that. He said, oh yeah, that, that's her maiden name. So all of these pieces of this puzzle are coming together in a really horrific way for Brian. Little did Brian know that Patricia's car was telling a very, very dark story about what, what had happened to Patricia. That's why he was there for four hours, because they were like, oh, have, have we got our guy? Spoiler alert, they did not. The Guardi had had this phone call the day before about this abandoned car, and they had been out to have a look, investigate. And luckily for them, the car was unlocked, so they could have a peek. Not that I think they would have wanted to. They found that something awful had happened in that car. There was no body in the car, but there was a lot of blood, and there was hair and fibres and, and tissue and things in the car, suggesting that there had been like a violent attack in the car. On the same day, a cyclist had found the naked body of a woman, a very disturbing sight to see because it was such a gruesome murder. Because of all of, all of the blood in Patricia's car and the fact that this woman was a woman and her body had been found, they were quickly sort of tying the two together. They had to match the blood and the hair that was found in Patricia's car to the body but also then the following day when Brian called in it was all like I say it was just a horrific puzzle coming together. After hours of interview and trying to sort of gauge and get a picture of Brian and if he was possibly the suspect in this they then showed Brian the wedding rings that they had found on the body and when he saw one of the rings it's very distinctive it had three bands and it was like a Russian style ring and his heart sank and he knew he knew it was definitely Patricia because that was her ring and then I just find this like yeah because quite often when somebody like I haven't ever heard of, of this happening so I felt really sick but they actually allowed Brian and also Patricia's brother to view like her body to I, to help identify it because DNA testing and things like that take, took a long time then, longer than it does now. And it was confirmed that the body was Patricia's through dental records, but again, that takes time. So although he, Brian had identified the wedding ring, he could, he could be wrong. There wasn't an engravement in it or anything. It could Someone else could have that same ring. So they allowed Brian and her brother to see the body and they did identify it as Patricia, but her body was so badly damaged that they, they had to use dental records to really make sure it was her because it, there was so much damage to her face. What a thing to see. What a thing to see. I mean, they agreed. They, they said that they would. But Brian said that after he saw Patricia's body, he was very unwell. He tried to make himself, he thought he was going to be sick. The investigation began. Now that they knew that this was Patricia, they needed to find out her movements on the night of her, or the night before her murder. So they talked to all of her colleagues, anyone that she might have met that night, and they started to put together a picture of what had happened for Patricia before she died. So she had met colleagues at Scruffy Murphy's. What a name. I love that at five o'clock and they were there from five until 10 p.m 
having a few bevies. Everyone said she was in good spirit. She was happy. The drinks were flowing. After this, the names, the names, I love names. I love a good name. After this, after Scruffy Murphy's, they went to Abra Kababra. Shut up. Abra Kababra. Yep. To get food. Kebabs, probably. They went to another pub and then they went to O'Brien's. Very Irish sounding pub. And then after that, it was around 12.30 and she went to a restaurant with a couple. And after that, she then, after they'd been in this restaurant, she then walked to her car. The couple that she was with said that they would walk to her car with her, but she said, no, 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 it's only down the road. Also, yeah, she was walking to her car. So Brian had said, oh, please don't drive, whatever, stay there. And she was not listening to that advice at all. She told her friends that she was going to get into the car, but only drive to a local hotel and she was going to stay in a local hotel for the night. However, there were other things going on and I'm not sure what happened there, but she was quite drunk. She was driving erratically and she was not heading towards a hotel at all at that time. Patricia's body had been found nine miles away from her car and there was this palm print that wasn't hers. So somebody else had driven her car after she had been murdered because it was in blood. So what they thought, their working sort of like idea was that she had picked up a hitchhiker, which wasn't unlike her, and that this had ended very badly, that they had then attacked her in the car, taken her out of the car and left her and then driven her car somewhere else and dumped it. That's what the, the theory was. The police then put her photograph in the media, in the paper. She, it was all over the news. It was everywhere. They wanted to get witnesses to come forward to say had they seen Patricia and it did work because it helped to paint a picture of what had happened after she'd left the town when she'd left her friends. So it was a bit naughty because she was drunk. She was so drunk that she was driving the car erratically and being dangerous. She was also quite upset. So whether that is because, who knows, I don't know why, but she was very emotional. Maybe it was just down to drinking. I do get quite emotional when I drink too much. On her journey, I think three witnesses or th three couples came forward to say that they had actually been stopped by Patricia. She was driving along in her white car. She would pull over and ask for directions to Conley Avenue. And I think every time everyone knew where Conley Avenue was and they tried to give her directions, but it's kind of a tricky place to drive around. And also she's pissed. So she wasn't like taking it in and she wasn't going in the right way. I mean, I think twice people gave her directions and then she just did the absolute opposite of what they said because she was off her pickle. She was very drunk. So, and she was very emotional and everyone said the same thing. So these people came forward and said, look, she stopped us at 1.45. She stopped us at this time, at this time. And she was never getting to where she was going. She was never getting it right, but she kept asking people for directions. Another witness came forward who was actually driving behind her and then stopped at lights next to her and gave her an earful, basically, because she was driving like a loony. And then he saw that she was very drunk. He realised she was asking about Conley Avenue. He realised that they weren't far from Conley Avenue. So he said, follow me. But when he turned right, she didn't follow and she wasn't there. And this driver, bless him, he sort of drove around to try and find her because he knew that she was drunk, that she was driving dangerously and that this was not OK. He needed to stop her, but he, he couldn't find her again. Conley Avenue. What's with Conley Avenue? Well, she had an ex-boyfriend that lived on Conley Avenue. And they believe, police believe, that she was trying to go and see him. I don't know why she was trying to visit him. But they did speak to her ex-boyfriend and he confirmed that Patricia never went there. She never made it. She didn't, he didn't see her at all. So she never got there. Around 10, 9, 10 days after Patricia's body was found, two people came forward. They called the police, the guardie, and they said, you know what? Apologies, by the way, if I've said police because it's the guardie, but, you know, old habits. So these people call the police and say, look, a friend of us has just told us that she knows the killer and the killer has confessed to her and we believe that you should come and you should speak to her because, wow. And they were not wrong. A woman named Rosalind had confided in her two friends 
The guardie then speaks to Rosalind and she gives her story of what had happened that Friday night. So at about 4am, can't believe people are still awake then, but hey ho, at 4am, they're walking home, herself and her boyfriend, Sean Courtney. They've had a night out, drinks have been flowing, a bit piddled. And then a white Peugeot had pulled up and asked for directions to Conley Avenue. And this woman, like everyone else's story, it was Patricia and she was emotional, she was upset and she was asking for directions. And then she said to this couple, can you just get in the car? I'll give you a lift home, but can you take me to Conley Avenue? Like, can you direct me there? So that's what happened. They get in the car. Sean Courtney gets in the front seat and Rosalind gets in the back and he's trying to direct her, but it's not happening. She's she's piddled. Rosalind then says, look, can you just drop me home? Because I'm knack at four in the morning, being out drinking. Once you're done, you're done. You want your bed. You're like, oh, come on, please. So she was like, can you just drop me home, please? I've, I've had enough of this. I'm done. Drop me home. And then it was agreed that Sean would then ca- go in the car with her and take her to Conley Avenue. Hours later, she's gone to sleep by now, Roslyn, because she waited up for half an hour for Sean, but he didn't come back. So she fell asleep. And then she's woken up in the early hours, or you know, six or something, by rocks on her window. And it's Sean. He's like, can you let me in? And he's freezing cold. He's cold to the bone. And she was like, she was a bit cross because she was like, I waited up for you. And you like, where were you? What, what happened? And he just said... Oh, I was outside. I, I stepped on the steps because I could not wake you up. And she thought, oh, OK. And then they went back to bed. Nine days later, Sean confesses to Rosalind that he is the person that murdered Patricia. The guardy then go to the barracks, the army barracks, which is where Sean Courtney is, where he's working, and they swiftly arrest him. Courtney had always wanted to be in the army from a very young age. He then eventually joined the army in 1985 and he had a wife. He married somebody called Amanda and they had three children together. He was in the transport platoon, driving all the vehicles and stuff like that. And he was he had a really good reputation in the army. And they even they said he would have gone far. He was a good soldier. So his record was like impeccable. In 1987, he went on tour to Lebanon. He would go on to do two more tours after that. He ended up having to shoot somebody. And he also witnessed his friend accidentally shoot himself, kill himself in a toilet cubicle. So it affected him very deeply. He then began having marital problems with Amanda. He started drinking really heavily. It was thought that he had PTSD from this second tour. And which he probably did, that's very traumatic, isn't it? To see somebody take their life, even if it was by accident. And because he was having trouble with his wife at home and things were tetchy, he decided to go on a third tour because you're away for about six months or so. And I think he was just like, let me just get out of the house. Like, you know, they weren't getting on. However, it wasn't a good move. And he didn't last very long. He was there for a few days, I think. And then he had to go home. He wasn't fit to be active in juicy. He was incredibly anxious. He he couldn't handle it. He was too, it was too soon. He spent a few days on a psych ward after he did come back to the UK. When he was young, he was bullied. He was quite badly bullied to the point where I think he had to go into an, another school. And at 12, he tried to take his own life. So that is that is, that is actually traumatic as well. So yeah, there were these these two things that were not, notable in his life. So at 12 years old, bullied badly enough to try and unalive yourself. Whoa. Came back, went to psych ward. His relationship with Amanda was it was it was too broken. So they separated. She went to live with I think his mum. He stayed in the house. And then shortly after this, he met Rosalind. So he, he'd barely been out of a relationship with Amanda and then he meets another woman and then he just really quickly moved in with her. So he then lives with Rosalind and his wife goes back to their family home with their children. When Courtney was arrested, he told the police about the night that he met Patricia. He confirmed Rosalind's story of events, you know, when they met and she was asking for directions, drop was and all of that. And then after that, when he wasn't with Rosalind anymore, he said that he was driving around trying to give her directions. Why he didn't just drive, I don't know. I mean, he was drunk too. 
He was trying to direct her to Conley Avenue and she just couldn't do it. So she was all over the place and she, she wasn't getting it. And then he said that she made some comments about, oh, you never know who you're gonna who you might pick up in your car. I could tell the police anything, couldn't I? I could say that you tried to attack me. So he said that she made a comment like that. He then said that she started to laugh about it and it really made him really angry. Like she was laughing about, you know, this, like, oh, I could get you, you know, I could accuse you of something. And he said that nine years before this or something like that, one of his friends had been accused. I'm not sure how long before. I think they spent nine years in prison. I've got that mixed up. But somebody that he knew had been accused of attacking a woman and it it wasn't true. Or, or we don't know that either. We don't know. But in his his opinion, or in truth, we I don't know because I don't know that story, but it wasn't true. And this person had gone to prison for like nine years. So he said that's why it like really angered him that she said that and then she was laughing about it. <coughs> and he said, because of this, he saw red. He was so furious. He was so angry with her. He couldn't believe it. And he got filled with rage and he punched her like a few times in the face. He knocked her unconscious. He put her in the passenger seat and then he drove off. He said he then drove towards the mountains in utter panic because he was like, what have I done? When they got to the mountains, he said that she came to and she started screaming. And because of that, he put his hand around her throat. And then he somehow she got out of the car. So she obviously fought him off and she got out of the car and she started to move herself away from him he said like you know she was on her on her back and like trying to sort of crawl backwards away from him and he 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 said he just went mad he said he picked up a rock and he hit her repeatedly with that rock in her face sometimes with two hands and that's what I mean about how gruesome it would have been to find her body because and how gruesome that was for her brother and her her husband to to see her in that way because it was very very violent and very very messy. Courtney said, "quote I just went mad." He said he just continuously just kept raining blows down on her, and then eventually, like her noises and screaming, it all just stopped. Something that I find bizarre is that he said that she at some point, I think he he said that she said this in her like dying breath but I, d- I don't think so I think she must have said this a lot earlier on but that he said to her that she said to him don't ruin your life but I cannot imagine with the damage that had happened and how she died that she said that with her like literally after that attack so he must have remembered that incorrectly or it wasn't true and it sh- he was trying to like sensationalize it but mm. and then he said he wanted to try and make it look like a sexually motivated attack why Okay, so he took all of her clothes off and he threw her clothes into like a field. He threw her clo- her shoes that she was wearing into the car and he left her naked body. Not only that, but before he left her naked body there, he got into the car and he reversed the car over her body. There is so much rage in, in this whole... And there's no... It's like ongoing rage because... He's punched her and then he's driven. Then he's got out and he's he's horrifically murdered her. And then he's stopped. And then he's taken all of her clothes off and stuff like that. It all takes time. And then he's still angry enough to reverse over her body. That is that is a lot of anger. He abandoned the car. So he drove like back towards home and he abandoned the car. He threw the keys into the canal, washed his hands because they were all bloody. And then he went home. He woke Rosalind and because he was wearing like black shirt or navy shirt and black trousers, she couldn't see the blood. She 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 didn't notice anything. He'd washed his hands off. And then he came in, he put all of his clothes at the end of the bed and got into bed. So she didn't even see the clothes. And then the next day he put them in the wash. He slept as well. So he wasn't too racked with anxiety about the whole thing. He slept that night until 3 p.m. the next day. Then he went out and got a takeaway. On the way back, he saw about the body being found in the paper and that made him feel a bit funny, so he was a bit quiet. And then he sort of lived the rest of his life quite normally for a while, like went to football, went to, did all of that. It wasn't until nine days later, he just became, he started, to, he felt haunted. He just started to think about it a lot. It was in the paper a lot and he started to feel but he he couldn't stop thinking about Patricia and he felt bad. So he then confessed to Rosalind. He also told Rosalind, oh, don't tell anyone. 
Come on, mate. The autopsy showed that Patricia had died from... Basically, she had drowned on her own blood. There was so much blood that she had suffocated on that. that. What a horrible way to die. She would have been unconscious because of the amount of blows to her head. There were graze marks on her buttocks and her knees and her back. So it suggested that at times she'd been trying to crawl away or get away and that he had, he was dragging her forcibly, like dragging her over the floor. She also had defensive wounds on her hands and the backs of her hands. And also it was noted that there was bruising to her inner thighs, but there was no sexual assault. They also noted that the attack had continued after she had passed away. So he continued to hit her with the brick even after she had died. 13th of January 1993, trial. And I can't believe it, but he wore full uniform to his trial and it was really frowned upon. The army were like, really? You know, you're a disgrace to the uniform if you've done this. They considered it, they were not happy about it and it was considered disrespectful. And he, because he wasn't pleading, he wasn't saying he wasn't guilty. He was pleading guilty, but under the you know like insanity because he was saying that it was like you know he was suffering from PTSD and he wasn't in his right mind so he wasn't denying that he'd done it he'd confessed so that's why they were like look you've killed somebody do not wear your uniform like you know disgrace it's a disgrace no thank you but he did the defense was that he was suffering PTSD and that he his marriage had fallen apart and everything had gone wrong I mean you can't that might be the case that he was suffering from PTSD, his marriage had fallen apart, he was heavily drinking, but I think the case for PTSD in in something like this, like some soldiers, it, it's so severe that they, um, that they I, I know what they were getting at, because there are cases where it's so severe that the, the soldiers can't, they're not living in reality, and like a noise might set them off and then awful things happened. But it, in his case, it seemed very, yeah, there wasn't a trigger to it. It just seemed like that wasn't, that wasn't what was going on here. The prosecution said he saw a very beautiful young woman on her own in a very vulnerable state, and he wanted to take his chances with that. So he quite happily was like, oh, yeah, let's drop Rosalind home. And then he, he had his chance. We will never know. But people do believe that he had tried to like come on to Patricia. He was like making advancements and she had rejected him. Don't forget, in her mind, she was possibly on her way to go and see her ex-boyfriend. So she's not thinking about this dude. She's then rejected him and that's why he has, this has all happened. He's punched her in the face, subdued her. And then basically he drove her to a secluded, quiet location. And there is something about that. The fact that there was bruising to her inner thighs. The fact that she'd sort of been dragged a bit on the floor and, you know, there was sort of like a, a kerfuffle makes me question whether he was trying to R-word her, trying to assault her, but he couldn't because, don't forget, he was really drunk as well. And that can play a big part with that sort of stuff, can't it? So, like, maybe he literally couldn't. And that is where that rage came from because, you know, she rejected him, then everything's like not working properly, and whew, rage. That is purely my speculation, but it could be, couldn't it? Because there was bruising there, like almost like something had that he tried to. He was found guilty. He was dishonorably discharged from the army not long after. And he was given a life sentence with a minimum of 20 years. That's not a lot, is it, for such a violent attack? After claiming that he had murdered her in such a horrific way because of PTSD when he was sentenced and all was said and done as he was walking past her family he shouted she was only an effing tramp oh like you're in your right mind now aren't you mm. I wonder did she piss you off and you lost your temper I think so the end of this story just makes me mm, I don't like it at all I don't like it at all. So after 15 years in prison, he was a model prisoner, apparently. And he started to have like, um, he was allowed out one Christmas and then he started having day releases. Then he started getting let out more and more often on weekends. Always um, 
he'll be under like license and stuff but so he's out and about then he got a job at, as a mechanic in a garage and they all facilitated this and I suppose like that is the point isn't it of the system to rehabilitate and get people back into the community I think that's the whole point but his crime was so vile after 20 years he was released that was the 1st of March 2013 as part of his license he is not allowed to drink so I suppose they're trying to sort of like make sure that he's he is safe in the community so he's not allowed to drink and he's not allowed to go in any clubs or pubs at all when he was on day release so between 15 years and 20 years when he came out he met somebody and he got that person pregnant and they have a child together so now he is just out of prison he's living his life he had three children as well with Amanda and he gets to see his kids I'm not sure about those kids but he see you know he's got this child with this woman and he just is living his life and it's sad because at the time when Courtney was sentenced made that vile comment when he was walking past the family Brian said to the press about you know at some point whether it's 10 years 20 years 30 years this man is going to walk out of here and he's going to have a life. He's got a family and he's going to carry on and just live as normal. And he, and you know, he said, but my Patricia will never have that. And that's what's really, it's really awful, isn't it? And that is all I have for you on today's case. I hope you've had a wonderful week. I can hear my small people, so I'm going to have to go because I'm not sure what's occurring. Anyhow, I will see you all on Friday. Oh, I'm so excited. Have a wonderful, wonderful week and I will see you Friday. Love ya. Bye.